In today's video, brakes. I had someone ask me, can you make a video explaining how the brakes on a motorcycle work? Um, and I thought, what a great idea, because not only can I talk about how the brakes work themselves, but I can also talk about uh, a little bit of hydraulics, and this will cross over to cars as well, so it'll be interesting. So anyway, let's start with the very basics. We all know uh, that motorcycle brakes are hydraulic. And that basically means something like this. So what we've got here is a syringe on this end, a piece of tubing through the middle, and a syringe on this end. Now there is water filling this syringe. It goes all the way through all the tubes, and there's no air bubbles in it. So, when I press this one down, that one goes up. And when I press that one down, this one comes up. And when you press both, nothing happens. It just feels solid. And that's because you can't compress liquids like hydraulic fluid, so you can transfer forces between two places with a bendy tube. And it can transfer quite a lot of power. I and mean, here is a big box full of nuts and bolts. It's got to be a couple of kilos at least. So we're going to put this end here, this one here, and press. See? There's a lot of force to be transferred there. But these two syringes are the same capacity, so whatever we press one side, we get on the other very equally because you're displacing the same amount of liquid, it's going to go into the other one, so it's going to end up being the same thing. However, if we take off this big one here, and get a very small one, now keeping in mind that this is a 10mm, and this is 1mm, a very small press on the big one has a big effect on the little one. But it's difficult, it feels hard. However, on the small one, very easy to press, but you only get a small movement out of this side, but that small movement is again very powerful. And this is the basis of how brakes kind of work, because if we try and use the big one to push the box using the small one, I'm really trying and it's difficult. However, if we reverse that, and we won't get a lot of movement because we're only, got, we're only displacing a small amount of fluid but it's very easy. It's the same way that a block and tackle works, which is basically, if you're lifting a weight, um, you put a pulley at the top and a pulley at the bottom, and you, rope, you loop the rope through the top one, down to the bottom one, through the top, so you, you basically, you pull twice as much rope to lift up, but with that, you get twice the power. So, by pulling the rope four foot, you're going to lift something by two foot, but you're going to have twice the force acting upon the object lifting than what you pulled on the rope because you're because where energy is just you know it's it can't it's just like a quantity that's given out it's really difficult to explain but as long as you put that in over time by pulling extra rope you get extra lift so long pull for the lever means small amount of movement on the caliper and uh, but that puts a lot of pressure on and that's what gives you your braking does that make sense now there is one more thing to show you, and it's very important because this is to do with why you need to bleed your brakes. I'm going to purposefully introduce air into the line. Right, so as you can see, that little silver line is actually an air bubble. So remember what I said about fluids not being compressible, so when you put a force on one end you get the same out the other end, like you're pushing on a piece of wood, you know? It's not going to just squidge in the middle. Well, if there's air in there which is compressible, this can happen. Now I'm, I've got hold of both syringes and I'm just going to push both at the same time. Now watch the air bubble. See it's shrinking? Because the air in the middle is compressing. Now that is what gives you your spongy feel on brakes. Now I'm pressing, as you see, now it feels like it should be firm, but it's got give that it didn't have before. And that's all down to one little air bubble. Now if you imagine you have lots of air bubbles and you slam your brakes on really hard, nothing's going to really happen because the pressure is just going to go and let off and it's not be very good at all. And also you lose all the feeling because the feel of the road of the brakes is it's the pads touch the calipers, um, sorry, it's the pads touch the discs. You feel it as vibrations through your finger. With the air bubbles, they remove it. it. It numbs it. So the feel is very important of brakes to have no air bubbles. And obviously for their functionality, they need to have no air bubbles. Ignore my Picasso good skills. So on a motorcycle, you're basically going to have the lever and the master cylinder, which is a box, and that attaches onto your handlebars, and you go handlebars, bars, you get it, okay? Then you have a cable coming off of that, going down the side of the fork, and that goes to the caliper. Now, from the side, the caliper looks like this. If we imagine this is the disc, either side of this, there are pads, like that, and then there is a piece of metal which is essentially a U-shape, like this. 
Okay, and that's your brake caliper. Now, on the brake caliper, you have the part which attaches it onto the bike frame, and this part in here moves backwards and forwards to allow the whole caliper to move side to side, and this is called a slider. Now, inside of the caliper, if you look at it like this would be the shape of the brake pad, kind of, and then the caliper would probably be something like that, not quite nearly as big as that, but you know what I mean. Now, behind here, you'd have these round things called pistons or pots and basically they are that shape inside the caliper they're hollow and when you apply the brake which forces uh, brake fluid in under pressure it pushes on these pots which are sealed by seals and they then pop out and push against your brake disc so you get that as I said, the slide is there to stop it so it can centre and be in the correct place. But essentially, they just get two brake pads pushing into the side of your discs like that. And that's exactly where you can uprate your brakes. If you're, for instance, you don't feel your brakes are strong enough, you can just change the master cylinder to one with a larger piston in it. So it's pushing more fluid or it's, it's done in a different way, basically, that gives you more force upon your caliper. But they do need to match within reason. Um, um, you know, you, I don't think you should put a really high-end master cylinder on a really low-end caliper. There needs to be some sort of middle ground. Just to show you, this is what brake pads look like. See, it's curved to go with the shape of the disc. There's two, and they oppose like this. Now, if you look, can you see there's grooves in them? You see there's a lot of brake pad left there to be used up. That's because these are only being partially used. When you get down to the bottom of that groove, I think generally that's when it's like, yeah, you really need to change these brake pads. You don't want to mess around with brakes. I should emphasize this. Brakes are the most important piece of safety equipment you will have over helmet and everything else. Because if you can't stop, you're not going to live very long. And there's no point going and getting a bike and, you know, sticking in a massive engine in it or doing loads of work and making it massively faster than it was and then not adjusting the brakes to compensate for the extra speed. Uh, it's very important to do those equally and if anything brakes first is good but if you go too far with brakes like you put you know you put a master cylinder on that was just too powerful for the caliper the second you touch it it'd want to lock up that's where you have to find that balance where it's a balance between a nice amount of pull and feel versus the front wheel locking it's it's where you get the feel from brakes is it starts to brake but doesn't really grip straight right away and that's where you get the feedback and the feel. Uh, to have diff different brake pads can help with that as well, you have sintered and non-sintered and, and different grades and varieties uh, depending on what you're doing. Same with discs and stuff, sort of cooling and venting and of course then there's carbon ceramics and all that sort of stuff but we're talking about everyday stuff, you're not going to have carbon ceramics on your bike and if you do, kind of have a go. Another thing to talk about is Brady brake lines and why you want them. Um, on a standard brake line, so imagine this is either side of it, this is made of rubber. When the force increases in here against between you know the lever that you're pulling with your hand, that's a hand there. His name is Jeff. Um, <laughs> force will force will naturally be applied in all directions onto the surface of the rubber hose. Now, in doing that, you'll lose some braking force because it's it's using it up by stretching the rubber. Now, a Brady brake line is a hose, like so, that's great, is a hose, like so. It doesn't have an extra thick, well it does kind of, because on the outside of the tube here, it has another layer of braided metal. So basically twisted up metal wires that make a lattice work that weave around it and stop the braking force is going up and down uh, from being lost by deforming the shape of the tube. You get that? It's pretty simple. Uh, so you get more feel and more feedback because it's more direct. You're basically, these tubes will numb the feel and will reduce power. That will sharpen it up. Again on brake lines, there is basically three setups with all bikes. You will have a front wheel with a caliper. You will have a brake line going up to the lever and the lever with a master cylinder. Yes? Simple. There is another version, like on lots of sports bikes, you will have a disc, sorry I should add it here, it's a disc here. You have two discs, so you have a caliper here and a caliper here. You have your lever and master cylinder, and then the cable tube line comes down to this caliper, and then with one single line, and then there's a second line out of this caliper which loops over the top and goes into the next caliper. 
So when pressure is applied, it forces it onto this one and then that's transferred over this one. So you, I think you're almost always going to get more force on this side over this side. Um, but it's, it's balanced in the hydraulic fluid, kind of. Now, there is another type, which you get on more high-end sports bikes, generally, or bikes. We have two discs, two calipers, one lever, one master cylinder, but on the master cylinder, you have one cable coming down to this side and an entirely separate cable coming down to this side. So obviously, when you're bleeding, for instance, these brakes, um, if you've ever seen, I'm gonna sort of explain that in a minute. The way that it works, basically, is that you will pull in the front brake and then on the caliper is a little nipple and you undo it and that will release some pressure. Then with, before you let go of this, you tighten that back up and you let this out. That then sucks liquid down out of the reservoir into the tube to fill it. And that's the way you pass air bubbles through because you repeat the process and the air bubbles come out. You've just got to make sure that you never allow that reservoir to empty because if it does, you're introducing an air bubble at the top and that's got to travel all the way to the bottom before you can get it out. So you basically, the second you let this run out, you get an air bubble, except the fact you've got to re-bleed the entire line. And on some dirt bikes, for instance, the, the brake line will be, that's the lever, master cylinder, and the tube will go over like that and then come down and across all. Some way like that, that basically ends up meaning that you have a perfect place for air bubbles to form. So it can be very difficult to get them out. On the system with the, the link tube, you I would, this is why I do it anyway, I would bleed this system completely, um, like you would, and then do this one separ uh, secondly, and then go back to the first one to make sure. So you just do the whole system. This way is exactly the same as this way, except you're doing it independently. So this is standard, and you'll find it on virtually every bike that's cheaper or smaller CC. And this is what you'll find on more budgety, not so expensive, or they don't think it needs so much braking force bikes, and this is what you'll find on your super e sporty, where you need all the braking force in the freaking world type brakes. Spicy 110. We'll, we'll give that to the first person that comments, I love to take vegetables in the butt. Uh, we should also talk about brake fluid. Uh, basically, you will notice on your bike, and I will show you this in a moment, it will say fluid, and it will say dot four. Now, Basically, the difference between dot four and dot five is at what temperature that liquid boils because it does get hot with the brakes. As the as the pads, you know, are pressed against the disc brake, that creates heat that's transferred through the pots into the liquid, and it can boil the liquid. Most bikes are dot four. Now, dot five and dot five point one are completely different, as I understand it, because dot five is normal brake fluid, and dot five point one is a glycol base, and it's very different. And you never want to mix dot five and five point one, because bad, 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 and you don't want to put it into the wrong systems. I know on some bikes it has to have a certain type, and if you put the wrong type in it, it'll eat your seals and ruin your entire braking system in a day. So make sure you get the right one, which is made very clear to you on the bike. Talking about on the bike, shall we have a look? Uh, now, this is the master cylinder on my XJ6, and that looks like it's low, but it's not because the bike's not on its uh, centre stand, it's on its side stand. So as you can see here, this is the reservoir with the liquid in it. And it says quite clearly on the top, this guy shouldn't be using a camera. No, um, can we see this? Use only dot four brake fluid. It's the first thing written on there. So only use dot four. This little symbol here, this means Brembo. This means good. These aren't as good as Brembo Brembos because these are stock Brembos that come on a bike. And trust me, the difference between what you get on the bike free Brembos and Brembos that you buy yourself is quite different, I believe. So, as you can see here, as you pull this in, this is a lever, this is your uh, fulcrum point, is that called? Whatever, pivot point. And this is what gives you the leverage. As you're pulling down on this, which you've got the whole length of this to pull, pushes in on this plunger, which pushes fluid along down into this through a banjo bolt. Now, this is a banjo bolt. Basically, what that is is just a bolt with holes in it through the sides, so the fluid can come down the bolt and out the sides, and inside of this brake line, it isn't solid, there's a gap, so it allows the fluid to transfer backwards and forwards. Okay, so, brake line, down the front, comes down, 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 into the caliper. Now, this is actually the link side. Now, you'll notice there's one coming in here, and there's one going out there, but this bike has got two calipers. 
and as you can see this is the main one that comes down from the lever that goes into the brake and then the secondary comes out and goes across to the other brake. That's because it's got a single master cylinder with a single brake line linked over to two calipers. Now on the DRZ, same thing, brake reservoir, the view glass is on the other side, so you can see, same system. Now this is what I was talking about, about coming over the top, you can get air bubbles form up here that are very hard to get to go vertically down, uh, and that's where you can have your squidging. Oh, very good actually, thing. I, didn't, I forgot about this. Uh, here you go, this is your classic looking rubber line, it's actually got a sheath over this part, but in this part can you see, see that look, that sort of ridged rubber? squidgy-ish, that is a normal stock brake line. This very hard, tough thing that looks more like a push bike cable is a braided line and this obviously gives you as much braking force as is possible to get from the combination of your master cylinder and your caliper. And as you can see, caliper is there, this is a twin pot, remember I was mentioning about pots? The number of pots will increase with brake calipers as well. These are twins. Um, you'll get other bikes with quads, so they're like 16 in total. This is a single pot because this is the rear caliper. Same system basically on the rear, so you have the caliper on the back, very short hose to a master cylinder here, and then the reservoir will be up in here, up here, connected by this hose, keeping it fed. 125s tend to have single or double pots on the front. Don't have, they don't have to have a massive amount of force because they don't need it. And the same with the rear, you don't want a massive amount of braking force on the rear because there's no weight on the rear. Now obviously one of the things in braking you should be aware with motorcycles is that, think about physics, when you pull the front brake on, the weight of the bike is going to transfer onto the front wheel, which is going to compress the suspension and that is going to give you extra braking force because it's pushing the tyre into the road at the same time the brakes are stopping you. On the rear, you never get that, it's always just dragging. The best tool I have for bleeding brakes is a jam jar with a hole in the lid and a plastic tube. Why? Because what you do is you attach one end onto the nipple from the brakes and you put the other end in the jar. Now when you are bleeding your brakes as the fluid comes out, rather than just having to look for a little like in a stream of liquid, you can physically see the bubbles inside the tube and then once you get you know, bubbly bubbly liquid, bubbly bubbly liquid, and then you get a nice couple of inches of clear liquid, no air bubbles, you know they've been bled right. Close it up, keep that end in, lift one end up, you have old manky brake fluid and a banjo bolt in there. It's good if you have two people, you can do it alone. Make sure this is full of fluid, put a cover over it, the cover that comes with it, not lock down, just place it because you need air to get in there. Um, to allow the fluid to go down, but you, when you let go sometimes it will squirt out and you don't want brake fluid on paintwork, plastics, anything like that because it is so corrosive it will ruin stuff. You loosen off the nipple, and the nipple is just here, normally under a cap, and looks like that. Then you put your plastic tube over the end of that, and you loosen it, but it's snug down, and then you pull in the lever, and at the same time you have it held all the way in, you undo the bottom one, which will squirt some fluid out. Then you close that before you release this, because then, when you let go, the suction, rather than sucking air in from down here, will allow it to draw more fluid down into the tube. Um, and basically, that's how you bleed brakes. Very simple, very easy, but I wanted to talk about more about the other ins and outs rather than the physically how to do it, because there's videos on there, and it's, it's too easy to explain to you. I mean, really, it's... It is. This is a perfect example of bog standard dot four, which can be used in cars or bikes. It's absolutely fine. Assuming that your bike doesn't take something specialised. For my bikes, it all takes just standard fluids. Um, as I say, very corrosive. You don't want to get it in uh, in the water, into drainage, into gardens. It's it's very very nasty shit, and you do have to get rid of it properly. And that means taking old fluid to an approved site, like a tip, that can get rid of it for you. One thing to note about brake fluid is basically it does not like water. And if you get water in it, it makes it shitty. So it's always good to replace your fluid every year or two. Once a year is a great idea, because you should be doing your pads quite regularly anyway. It depends on what you ride, I suppose. Um, but a bottle like this will refill your entire system and let you flush it out several times over. Many times over, in fact, depending on how many cables and tubes you have. And this about eight quid. 
equally don't keep it too long because it can, as I say, kind of go off. So maybe get a half size and that will last you for a good year or two. That's kind of how brakes work, how hydraulics work, how you bleed them without physically showing you. And if you want to see how to physically bleed the brakes, watch Jake the Garden Snakes, um, part of his bolt on series where he did brake calipers and stuff. Perfect explanation. Shows how it really squirts. Um, but I would have used the tube method and then it wouldn't squirt everywhere, it would just go in the jar. So I'm sorry I can't remember the person who asked me to do this, uh, but I hope that that has answered some questions for you and been interesting to others maybe, don't forget if it was, leave a like or a dislike if you really want and a comment and subscribe to the channel and all that stuff and there's links in the description for stuff and ways to support the channel and yada yada. Go and have fun on your bike. Now for today's extra content, we take the large syringe and the small syringe and apply lots of pressure. Hey! <laughs> oh, she's a squirter! Right, so like, get this come off. Yeah, if it's not moving, then that's when you apply, like, you know, pressures. Yeah, Derek! Oh, please Every be now and then a bike size. needs a good bloody run. It is! Make sure that it's got good oil in it, and it's warmed up. Now one of the weird things about Derek I've noticed more so 